Hi there. I'm Corey Quinn, and I'm a cloud economist. You may have little to no idea of what that means, but that's okay, because I have no idea what it means. Fundamentally, I took an engineering background and applied it to an expensive business problem that nobody would wake me up about at 3 in the morning, namely the horrifying AWS bill. Four years later, we're seven employees, our customers spend over a billion dollars a year on cloud services, and we have angry opinions that we back with data. I also write the last week in AWS newsletter, which gathers the news from AWS's cloud ecosystem, gently and lovingly makes fun of it, and then goes out every Monday and Wednesday to over 20,000 readers. I also host a pair of podcasts, Screaming in the Cloud, which is a serious interview show about the business of cloud, and the AWS Morning Brief, which allows me to indulge my ongoing love affair with the sound of my own voice and what I imagine to be humor. Last year, Analytica ran an analysis that determined I was the greatest cloud influencer in the world. I've been completely insufferable ever since. Now, the reason I bring all of that up is to validate that while you are going to see some of what passes for humor in this talk, I do know what I'm talking about. And today, that's what I'm here to do talk to you about the top 10 mistakes we see in the world of managing cloud costs. We start with the usual stuff that you'll see in every talk about cloud economics. If this is the kind of thing you're into, great. Allow me to refer you to every single talk about cloud cost optimization other than this one. It's always the same tired advice, and it doesn't matter if someone's giving you this talk in 2020 or in 2012, because it doesn't really change. This is proof that the advice given here doesn't actually work for crap. Instead, I'm going to talk to you about the top 10 terrible mistakes that I see companies making around cost. Let's get started. We begin, of course, with running Kubernetes. You might chuckle at this and think that I'm being either intentionally antagonistic or setting up to make a clever point, but I'm not doing either of those things. We had a large enterprise client who had their cloud billing divided into Kubernetes and everything else. Kubernetes was a giant expensive question mark. From the perspective of a cloud provider, you can spin up a whole bunch of instances and run all of your workloads inside of Kubernetes and then get yourself into billing hell. That's because to that provider, you're really just running a single workload, Kubernetes. There's no visibility at all into what workloads are going on inside of that environment. Scaling your clusters up or down is a ridiculous fantasy that everyone talks about, but effectively nobody actually does. So in practice, it's a bunch of big instances sitting around that cost you the same every hour of every day. Those instances talk to each other in weird ways. In AWS, transferring data from one availability zone to another in the same region costs the same as it does to transfer it from one region to another. Two cents in most cases, although there are exceptions that are egregiously high. Kubernetes also has no sense of zone affinity. So that weird workload that the cloud providers are seeing, it spends an inordinate amount of time not only talking to itself, but racking up the bill as it does so. Worst of all, you can't really attribute those costs to workloads within those Kubernetes clusters other than by what basically amounts to dead reckoning. You squint, you figure that 70% of that cluster is for workload A, the rest is for workload B, and that's how you allocate it. Now, namespaces do kind of work to solve this in a somewhat passable way, but now where do you wind up putting the AWS primitives that Kube needs regardless of workload or capacity? How do they get attributed? They often don't or can't be because there's no tagging mechanism for any of these things that actually freaking works. When the world isn't melting down into a recession fueled by a pandemic, you generally care a lot more about allocating where your spend is going than shaving dollars and cents off of the bill. This client went with Kubernetes originally because they were hybrid. They had workloads in data centers and they had workloads in cloud. They wanted to move workloads between those two environments seamlessly, and the middle layer that did that was, of course, called Kubernetes. What they were doing was improving their data center at the expense of their cloud environment. Every year, until this one at least, the CEO of AWS gets on stage at reInvent in Las Vegas and unleashes a torrent of product and service announcements. They're bizarre. Two years ago, they announced something called Ground Station, a service that's used to talk to satellites in orbit around Earth. This is a legitimate service that exists, but at least a third of you watching this are reasonably sure I'm making it up for the sake of a joke. I'm not. AWS has over 200 services. And yet, over 80% of spend on AWS comes down to just five. EC2, RDS, 
S3, EBS, and data transfer, which all sounds like a bunch of letters that I'm throwing at you, but roll with me here. The rest of the spend is either long-term strategic bets, interesting technologies that customers have asked for, or something else. Remember that every AWS service is for someone, but no AWS service is for everyone. Just because your cloud provider has built a thing does not mean that you should use it, or frankly, even that you can. If you're using something that your cloud provider has built as soon as it launches, you're going to run into tricky edge cases. A company who is very excited to use Amazon's MSK, their managed Kafka service, instead of running their own Kafka, jumped aboard as soon as it came out. Now, every time I talk to that company about a new release that comes to Amazon's offering of it, their response is, well, that sure would have been nice to have at release time instead of this ugly, hacky workaround that we spent a month building since that thing is a core feature of Kafka that we still can't believe that Amazon forgot. There have been no fewer than six of these after-the-fact releases that would have made their jobs easier. Sometimes Amazon releases features that you'd swear I was making up to insult Amazon unfairly. One that was my favorite was Amazon Neptune now supports TLS. Now, as I said in my sarcastic newsletter, the far bigger story was that it somehow launched without supporting TLS in the past few years. We've long since passed the point where I can talk incredibly convincingly about AWS services that don't really exist and not get called out by AWS employees. There are over 200 of them. Who's to know which ones are real or not? Just because a visionary from your cloud provider shows up to tell you what the future is going to look like on stage doesn't mean that you need to be the 